Secretary Priti Patel joins us now on Good Morning Britain. So, very good morning to you, Home good Secretary. Um, we've got a lot of things that we want to uh, catch up with you on. But the first thing I want to do is just to clarify a couple of things. Because you did a press conference uh, last week to clarify the rules surrounding COVID. Um, and at the Downing Street press conference, where you were repeatedly asked to clarify rules, you said they were very simple. However, you also said that outdoor recreation is permitted in a restricted and limited way. Um, do you now acknowledge that outdoor recreation is one of those things that is prohibited under the COVID rules? Well, exercise is what I was referring to um, specifically and people taking their daily exercise. It's all very well to take snippets of what I've said out of context. I mean, recreation, as far as I was referring to, is very much about exercise walking um, and you know doing that one daily exercise that people can do um, and I you know I was emphasizing last week because I emphasize frequently in fact every day we desperately need people to follow the rules and the lockdown rules because of the situation that we are we in. do we absolutely do and the point is we need them to be absolutely clear outdoor recreation covers things like snowball fights or picnics and absolutely those are prohibited under the rules. Exercise, however, as you say, is allowed. On this morning, last Thursday, you said people in England should be exercising on their own. Now, do you acknowledge that that's not the case, that actually you can exercise with one other person outside of your household? And the reason well, that I say this is that I, I'm asking whether you have sympathy with people who are still a little bit confused about the rules. And when you say they are very clear and very simple, if you yourself are getting them muddled up, that's not the case, is it? Well, first of all, I'm not getting them muddled up. Um, when I've spoken about exercise and recreation, I put it within that context. And it is a fact, again, when I was asked questions about exercising specifically, um, it was about riding cycles and running, which people do tend to do on their own. And I also said that we should not be using exercise for socialization. And it is right, and it is a fact that people can exercise in their bubbles. Now, when I was speaking, specifically about exercise last week on, on other programs, this programs, press conference, I was specifically referring to exercising on your own. Um, and that is what I was speaking about um, very much on exercising. Sorry, you've just said that you can exercise with your bubble. Are you saying that, that, that people can exercise outside of their bubble? I was saying, first of all, last week, you've asked me about my comments last week, I was referring to exercising on your own because people were asking me questions about running and cycling. Um, people can exercise um, alone with one person or within their household or support bubbles. Um, and that is in the regulations, that is in the rules that has been stipulated. OK, Home Secretary, can I ask you, yesterday we had 1,610 deaths recorded uh, in the past 24 hours in the UK. That's the highest daily increase of the entire pandemic. And it comes at a time when the seven-day average has the UK as having the worst death rate in the entire world from coronavirus. Can you explain to me, because Brandon Lewis yesterday failed to do so and, in fact, refused to do so, can you explain to me why we have currently the worst death rate in the world? Well, I think we have to put much of this into context. I mean, every single death is just deeply tragic and this pandemic has affected and blighted all our lives. And there are too many families that have lost loved ones. Now, if I may, I don't think there is one single factor or cause as to why so many people have died in the United Kingdom and why we've seen so much in terms of pressures in the NHS. There'll be a range of reasons as to why the numbers are so high, including people, patients with comorbidities, certain ethnicities as we know that are more susceptible to coronavirus. And we, we've seen this repeatedly, you know, people... But these are issues, Home Secretary, if I may jump in, these are issues which, of course... Uh, are relevant to most other countries in the world. They also have comorbidity issues. They have mixed, yes. uh, mixed populations and so on. They don't seem to meet unique issues for the UK. And I simply... I just would like to know whether the government has worked out why we currently have the worst death threat in the world, why we're seeing these scary numbers of people dying when this is not happening in most other places in the world. What is it that we're doing wrong? 
Well, we don't know that it's not happening. I mean, the way we record data differs from other countries. So I think, you know, we just put it in that context. So that chart, that chart is wrong, is it, when it, when it has us um, at the I'm top? I'm not saying the chart is wrong. We record, we all record death data and, uh, you know, coronavirus data very differently. We use ONS as our method of collecting data and that gets published in a way in which many other countries don't publish their data. But I think, look, we are in a terrible, terrible situation with the pandemic and also the number of people that have tragically died. Um, there is a lot that I think we can reflect upon, look back upon. But when when it comes to deaths, we're still in this pandemic, and it's quite clear you've seen from the numbers yourself yesterday, 1,600 people. There are 33,000 people going down with coronavirus. We see 38,000 people in our hospitals right now. Tragically, these numbers are likely still to continue to with, rise. With hindsight, with hindsight, was it a terrible mistake for the government to basically say to people, get together with your families at Christmas? Because this strain became public knowledge around the 19th, I think, of uh, December. Before the new... that, it was a few days before the 19th, was it? Yeah. It was the 14th when Matt Hancock told the House of Commons... It was when we first became aware there of it, yeah. was a new strain. But the announcement, the announcement of the details of that new variant came, I think, on the 19th, and we were made aware this was very fast transmitting. This was when the science had come across the desk of the government. And at that stage, it would have seemed the most prudent thing to do would be to move very, very quickly in a way we didn't do in the first lockdown, but we didn't. We let it run for days under a tier system. Mm -hmm. uh, then we get to this ridiculous day that many people think, well, on Christmas Day, families are encouraged to get together as if the virus is having a day off. And now we were told at the time by those who thought it was a bad idea, you're going to see the death rates rocket if we do this. And, and now, and behold... sure enough, three weeks later, we are seeing the death rates rocket. So is it... Is it fair to say that that was a big mistake by the government? Well, to be very candid, we don't know because this virus is mutating in many different ways. Obviously, there was the Kent issue, the Kent strain, as it's now become known, and now we have other strains of this particular virus. Like all viruses, this mutates. Um, but the fact of the matter is, I think, along with mutations of the virus, and now, of course, with the vaccine role, rollout program. There are different measures that we're having to put in place to protect the efficacy of the vaccine. How big a problem, how big a problem uh -huh. is the vaccine supply? Because what's quite clear now is that there are issues with the supply of the vaccine mm -hmm. from Belgium, from the Pfizer plant, because they're doing some kind of revamp of their plant, presumably to meet the global supply demands. But, you know, it's very worrying to see the death numbers rocketing at the same time as we're seeing the vaccine rollout numbers going down day by day. What is happening? So, first of all, I think it was inevitable that the likes of Pfizer and AZ, they are reconfiguring their supply chains and their ability to process and manufacture the vaccine. Demand is just enormous and beyond, beyond comprehension. I think it's fair to say this will make it challenging in terms of you know, just having a streamlined approach to the delivery of the vaccine. There are going to be inconsistencies in terms of vaccine rollout, and we're seeing that. Um, this will be one factor, but the government has also been pretty clear that by mid-February, we've got priority cohorts, people that are susceptible susceptible to dying from coronavirus, the 80 pluses, those in their 70s, those with comorbidities, the vulnerable people. It's our objective to absolutely make sure that they are vaccinated. Yes, and you've got a target, Priti Patel, that by mid-February, those people will be vaccinated, 15 million. But in order to do that, you need to be vaccinating 400,000 people a day. And we know that over the last couple of days, the rate is going down. Now, that must be enormously concerning and might raise the spectre that you are not able to vaccinate all of the uh, elderly and vulnerable by your target. Are you acknowledging there is a supply problem? And is the supply problem down to the Pfizer factory? Well, look, the, it is a fact that the factories are being reconfigured to manufacture more of the vaccine. That's no bad thing, actually. But once we have more vaccines coming into the system, and also, I should say, even more vaccination sites which will complement greater vaccine supply, we will absolutely be able to vaccinate more people. And currently, as we know, we're averaging around 140 jabs per minute. So we will see, potentially, you know, inconsistencies in terms of day-to-day -day vaccine numbers. But if you're so that... only vaccinating half the number of people you should, 
do you acknowledge you will not reach your target by mid-February? We don't know that. We simply do not know that, particularly if there is more vaccine that comes forward, let's say, next week, the week after next, along with greater vaccination size um, and more contact with people to get the vaccine to them as well. So the greater the number of vaccine supply that we have, and also alongside with the bolstering of numbers... Of, of course, sun, if you get the vaccine, but are we guaranteed that supply under the current circumstances? Well, we're working with the... NHS and obviously with JCBI in terms of the vaccine supply and the vaccine logistics and the delivery of that. But as I've said, we will see inconsistencies. We're seeing that around the country right now. Reconfiguration of supply chains will have an impact, as you've already highlighted from the numbers that have taken place in vaccinations this week. But it does not mean automatically that you know we will not be able to meet our objective of getting to the vulnerable by mid-February. That okay. is absolutely on, uh, on March the 17th, last year, Sir Patrick Vallance told MPs if we can get this down to numbers of 20,000 in terms of coronavirus deaths in the UK, that is a good outcome. We're now at over 100,000, so can we agree this has been a catastrophically bad outcome? Well, when you look at the number of deaths, the number of deaths is absolutely catastrophic. Um, appalling in every sense of the word. And that is partly because back in March, no one could speculate or even conceive how challenging, not just this pandemic, but how deadly coronavirus would be. Um, none of us knew at that stage. But people look, OK, but let me, let me just say then again, you should have learned lessons from then. We made a series of terrible mistakes in that first wave, in my estimation. But you had seven, eight months to prepare for a second wave that everyone knew was coming. And again, I ask you, that government decision, the desperation for people to have Christmas with their families, given the scale of uh, infections and deaths now going on raging across this country, that was a mistake, wasn't it? What you should have done was told people not to, do, not to congregate in big gatherings with their families. Well, we were telling people over Christmas not to congregate in big gatherings. And I recall, I think, even coming on the programme around Christmas, just before Christmas, asking people to keep, you know, their Christmases very, very small, very limited. But you've been very specific, Home Secretary, in telling people what they can and can't do in terms of, you know, arresting people in fields for having a cup of coffee. But you didn't stop people congregating on Christmas Day. You didn't, as a government. No. And I'm only asking... 38 million people in England... Had, had I shown one, you... ..two and three were allowed to gather in three households on Christmas and Day. And the point being, had, had you looked at these numbers that we're looking at today, you wouldn't have been so lax, would you? You would, as a government, presumably, have said, we c I'm sorry, but you can't meet up, as we now can't. Well, I think, first of all, all decisions, um, pre-Christmas, after Christmas, throughout this pandemic, all decisions are taken based on advice, listening to Sir Patrick Balance, Chris Whitty, others who provide the government with advice and many medical professionals too. Um, and that is why when we went into Christmas, we were clear about saying, please restrict your level of contact with people throughout that Christmas. Why didn't you do what you're telling people now, which is stay at home, don't see your families, because the risk is too high. Because if you had well, done that, if you had... I'm just saying... Looking at we, what's we looking not speculate. At, well, we're not speculating. Most, most people, no, no. Were, most scientists were predicting this would be a very bad decision that the virus doesn't we have a day off. Of, and of course, we were following much of the advice that we were taking at that time in the run up to Christmas by scientific. Advice. So your scientists, just to just to clarify, your scientists instructed you that it would be safe to go ahead with families meeting up on Christmas Day because that's what they we were. Is that right? We listened to advice, and the advice was for individuals to have very small gatherings, to restrict the numbers, and to reduce social contact. And that is what the government suggested and, rec well, recommended at the time, advocated in that pre It was a mistake, though, wasn't it, Home Secretary? We can all see well, that now. That is a view. that is a view that you hold. The fact of the matter do you, do is... Do you hold it? lockdown right now we're in a lockdown it's not about my view right no, we're now, in a lockdown now but we weren't in lockdown on christmas day and now we're seeing 1600 people's deaths being recorded well there are many other people doing other things around christmas we had tearing we were giving strong guidance and recommendations no, but we're now in a lockdown contact, that would have prohibited reduced travel i get it i get it i get it i'm just saying that now you couldn't meet up with your families but on Christmas well, Day, on well, Christmas Day, I, I you were think told let's, you put could. Into, let's put this into context. There are many, many families across the country that did not get together mm. with 
their immediate families, members and their loved ones um, throughout that Christmas period and actually did hold very, very limited... Yeah, so you don't, the law you don't, you don't, you don't allowed wish... millions of families to meet in groups of three the households point is many on people, Christmas Day? Many people believe that the right thing to do, given the scale and speed of this new variant, once it all became public knowledge, the right thing to do would have been to order the country into a national lockdown of the kind we're now in. And that the failure well, to do that and to allow families to meet at Christmas has now turned out to be a catastrophic mistake. That's the point. Well, well, well that's, we don't know that. And we had said repeatedly in the run-up to that Christmas period in particular, to reduce social contact, to have very restrictive um, Christmases. We were not telling people to get together in mass gatherings. No, but you weren't I telling them they couldn't, and that's the that. difference between now and um, then. No, we were telling people not to meet with wider family members. You I mean, allowed you to... them to do it yeah. under the rules. You can't say, well, on the one hand, we allowed people to do it, and on the other hand, we told people not to. We it's exactly what we knew you were going to do back in December. <laughs> You're going to allow people to do it, you were going to allow people to mix, and in January, you were going to blame people who did, who knew it was legitimate, under the rules, you were going to blame them for what then happened, even though well, it was I... within the government's control to change that. I think, first of all, the government is not blaming anybody. The majority of the British public have been following the rules. Um, and I just really just want to emphasise that point. Um, and we know this. I mean, I've seen... You know, I've seen a lot of research, a lot of data in terms of public attitudes as well to lockdown, coronavirus regulations. What makes them quite cross, actually, are people that are breaking the rules. Um, and that's why you hear me speak so frequently about compliance and enforcement. That's why you see our police officers enforcing the rules. Yeah. Well, what you mentioned... OK, you mentioned police. Drinking coffee or whether it's for social gatherings. OK, you mentioned... All right, um, you mentioned the police. I want to get this in... We're running out of time. I want, to get, I want to get this in before we run out of time. 400,000 crime records have disappeared from the police national computer on your watch. What did they contain and how many operations uh, may now be damaged by what has happened? Well, first of all, let me just explain the context within which this has happened. This is down to... We, we have to um, remove a lot of police data and we do that on a weekly basis. So this is a coding error um, that has basically led to a number of records relating to offences, arrest records and individual people um, that have potentially been lost. We don't know, primarily because there are multiple records across multiple systems around offences and individuals. Now, currently, we're putting through new data code to wash through all of that. This national computer is actually working, so law enforcement partners can still access it and still upload data. But currently, I can give you this assurance, we're working night and day with technicians. Right, but can you give us an assurance? Because we know that on at least one instance, a DNA profile from a suspect in custody did not generate a match to a crime scene as expected, potentially impeding the investigation of the individual's involvement in the crime. Some serious criminals are going to get away with it because of the incompetence of this process. No, well, it's not about serious criminals um, getting away with anything because multiple records are held on the same individuals and on the same crimes on other profile profiling systems as well. So one of the things that we will look at is also potentially uploading from different systems back into the national computer um, files, data and records, if that is something... Given the scale of the number of records which have gone missing here, have you considered your position as Home Secretary? Well, first of all, we don't know. There is no guarantee of the number of records. This is speculation. Well, we know right now they're not there, right? Well, we don't know that. We absolutely well, do where not. Where have they gone? At all. Um, they've been. They could still be on the system because this but is. But you a haven't found them. Just to clarify, you haven't found it them yet. It takes time. We haven't found them right now. Okay. We are wow. With our software so engineer. you've lost four hundred thousand so crime. Okay, data. but just to just to be. Just... This is on one system. Let me just be I, clear. I understand, but you've lost fingerprints, DNA and arrest records for 400,000 people. Many people would we think... We don't know that many... they are lost. Well, we know that... You don't know where they are, do you? We cannot access them through this particular right. system. Do you know where they are? You're the Home Secretary. Records. Do you yes, know where so these does... records are? So, if you let me finish, it does what not... What are you mean... reading, by the way? ..where these multiple records are right now. Right. So, we have other systems where these records and this data will be stored, and there are multiple records on individuals... Right, but on you a... don't know where they are, do you, Home Secretary? 
we have there are other systems we do have other places no, just right now just to clarify yes. you as the home secretary have no idea where these 400,000 crime records are do you they could still be in the police national computer but you don't know that they've gone we do not know that for sure right so why would you say you do when you don't know that place. Well, because there are other systems where this data is... But you also don't know they're there. You've just made that up. Police national computer. You've literally just invented that. You don't know where they that, are. That is not correct at all. There are multiple records. So you do know where they are? The data batches. You do know where they are? So we can, we can find that where, data... Where are they, if you know where they are? So they're on other law enforcement systems. Right, but where are they? they they'll be on other computer systems. You don't systems. know that, do you? You've law just made that up. Systems. I have not made that up. You don't know. You don't know there are other systems. You do not know that as a fact, do you? There are multiple records around these individual data categories. Right. Do you know for a fact or not that they exist on other that, systems? That, that is a fact. I've already said if we have to find. Right. So you do know. You do know where they are. Um, well, we have them on other systems. I can't listen uh, to Home you. Secretary, with respect, you don't know where they are, or you would say where they are. I've already made it quite clear there are multiple records right. um, in relation to these particular data sets that we are so trying you, to... So just to clarify, you do know where they are? They are on other systems... Which ones? Which systems? Into. I've already said I can't tell you the names of those particular systems. Right, so you're saying, as a fact, as Home Secretary, these 400,000 crime records, which we've all assumed have disappeared, you know for 100% certainty they exist elsewhere and therefore there's nothing to worry about. We have not said... The other thing is we have not said that they have completely disappeared. This is down to software. They could still be in the police national computer. Yeah, but you don't know that, do you? Okay. Well, it's fingers crossed problem. you can find them. We this do is very know that serious. this is a Four, software issue. 400,000 crime records, Home Secretary, computer. is a very serious matter. Yeah. It is a serious matter, which is why we are trying to retrieve this data um, at pace and working with software... Okay. If you don't find them... Night and day to retrieve if you don't this find data. them, having just told us that they exist elsewhere, if you never find them, will you resign? We are working night and day to bring these records back. That wasn't my question. My question is, if you don't find them, I will you resign? I have already told you, Piers, we are working night and day with our engineers... I know, but if you don't find them, having just told us... You, to having just data. told us that they exist elsewhere, if you don't find them, will you resign? It's my imperative to make sure we secure this data. And if you don't, will you resign? I've said it's our imperative and my imperative as well. As Home Secretary, okay. A, to keep the public... also to find this data. Home Secretary, thank you very much indeed for joining us.